Herefordshire, England, home of the headquarters for Britain's Special Air Services. SAS fighters were performing routine drills when the orders came through from Lord Guthrie, head of the British Army. Pack their jungle fighting equipment and prepare for battle. A British regiment was being held hostage by a dangerous rebel army deep in Sierra Leonean jungle. The SAS, the British Special Air Services, they're the special operations force that we modeled all of our special operations after. They set the model for the rest of us to follow. Assuming they even make it to their target without being shot out of the sky, the rescue force will be outnumbered more than five to one. They face hardened fighters with an unparalleled knowledge of the terrain. It will be the toughest fight of their lives. When they realized they could only go in via air, that was when the men of the SAS, the men who were tasked to go in and do this hostage rescue, coined the phrase, the nickname for the mission, Operation Certain Death. Welcome to Covert, a show about the shadowy world of international espionage and top secret military operations. I'm Jamie Rennell, and I'm going to take you inside history's greatest special forces missions to learn about the brave soldiers who risked their lives to terminate the world's most wanted men, eliminate terrorist threats, and protect countless innocent lives. The odds were against us, totally. I mean, we flew into their village, into their backyard, with two of the biggest helicopters in the world. As told by the people who were there. If that wasn't bad enough, they also had a a belief that we find hard to understand, but they had this belief that voodoo would protect them to such an extent it would make them bulletproof. Last time, we talked about how this British regiment got themselves into this situation and how negotiators tried to reason with their captors. In this episode, we go behind the battle lines to learn about the planning and high-stakes execution of one of the most dangerous Special Forces missions in history. Operation Certain Death, Part 2. September 8th, 2000. It had been over two weeks since 17 soldiers from Britain's Royal Irish Regiment on routine patrol in Sierra Leone were taken hostage by a local rebel army, the West Side Boys. Former SAS fighter Phil Campion. It wasn't until that we moved forward into Sierra Leone itself, that the, 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 the focus starts coming down, then you start thinking, right, this is going to happen. You know, and even if it doesn't, we need to be ready for it. Phil wasn't yet going into battle. Instead, he was on his way to a mock village. Author Damien Lewis. They built a mock village. So they basically used the map that the hostages, Major Marshall, had given the British, the British commanders. They used that and their own intelligence and satellite photographs provided by the Americans. And so they actually constructed mock-up huts, mock-up gun positions, mock-up emplacements. And using that, including the location where the British soldiers were being held hostage, they rehearsed the assault time and time and time again. They would be going in in four-man fire teams. And each four-man fire team had specific targets that it had to take down within the rebel base and they rehearsed it in this mock-up village but each four-man team had its own mission objective its limit of exploitation the area beyond which it would not operate because that was its responsibility so it was to take down a mortar emplacement to take out a machine gun emplacement to go and try and take down Frodo Calais the West Side Boys, Boys commander or capture him alive. At the training ground Phil Campion's SAS unit were told they'd be the front line of the attack. Phil was tasked with practicing a fast rope descent out of a Chinook helicopter to land mere feet from the hostage's hut. There was a floor pan built of the village so that you knew roughly how far you had to go, what your limits of your particular arcs were and that sort of stuff, an arc being where you can fire and where you can't fire. The height of battle it could be quite confusing as to who's where and who's doing what. You know, there's going, to be, there's going to be screaming, shouting, all sorts of explosions and noise going off. And so the last thing you want to do is, is slot one of your own because you've been unsure where you should have been in that village. You almost know to the footstep where you're going to be in that village at any one time. But then like I say, any, any, the best plan in the world is always, is always up for a fuck up, isn't it? You know? So 
it can go completely the opposite way to what you expected in the first place. So I want to give you a number. Over 600,001. That's how many small businesses use Stamps.com for all their postage needs. Can you believe that? We just signed up for it here at the studio, so we're the one. That's how good it is. If you run your own business and you ever mail stuff, I mean anything at all, once you check out Stamps.com, you'll sign up. It's like getting a real post office right at your desk, 24 hours a day. There are no hidden fees, no special hardware. You just use your computer and your printer. They'll even send you a digital scale. You can weigh letters and packages and print the exact amount of postage. So easy. Plus, they have special discounts you can't get anywhere else. Here's what you need to do. You need to sign up now because they've got a special offer for covert listeners. You get a four-week trial, and that includes postage and a digital scale. So go to stamps.com, and before you do anything else, look for the little microphone up in the corner. You're going to click on that and type in covert. That's stamps.com. Enter covert to get your special offer. 600,001 small businesses can't be wrong. At the same time as Phil would be rescuing the hostages, a force of 150 paratroopers would launch a second attack on the base across the river, disarming the fighters before they could spray the helicopters and SAS positions with mortar and machine gun fire. At the mock village, everything seemed to go to plan. But they are only fighting West Side boys in a demonstration. Many of the real rebels are war-hardened fighters with an intimate knowledge of the thick jungle terrain, after all, it's their territory. We didn't know what to expect. They could have taken the hostages away from the village. You know, so all the time that we know where the hostages are is the time that we have to act. Late at night on September 9th, Major Marshall was woken by a tapping sound on the wooden shutters directly above his head. Marshall watched as a gloved hand reached through the window and pushed a folded up piece of paper into the corner of the wooden frame. It was at night, the hostages were in their room, and a piece of paper was stuffed through the shutters of their window. And the Major went and pulled this piece of paper out, and it said, it was just written a handwriting piece of plain paper, and it said words to the effect of, don't worry yourself lads, the boys from Stirling are coming soon. Now, Stirling is known to all and sundry in the military as the code for the SAS because the SAS was founded by David Sterling. It said the boys from Sterling from Hereford are coming soon. Hereford is the SAS base. And so somehow the British assault force had got a note to the hostages that there was going to be a hostage rescue assault. It was going to be the SAS who were doing it and that they should expect an assault force to come in and try and rescue them, which meant they were forewarned to expect British soldiers to come into their room and secure it. At the base, Phil Campion received orders to make final preparations before deployment. I can't really go too much into the tactics because I don't want to give massive amounts away, but now, now you, you, you've upped the ante. You know, your weapons are out of the bag, they're being zeroed, they're being cleaned. Your kit's being packed as to what you want to take in with you. You're beginning to get a bit more intelligence. Briefing boards are going up. You're looking at stuff. People are now discussing who's going to do what job, who's going to go where. You're quite up for it, you know what I mean? And that's what a lot of these, these organisations don't realise. You know, they're quite happy to do horrible things. We're quite happy to help them. You know what I mean? We're quite happy to put them out of misery because it's not, you know, that's what I joined up to do. That's soldiering. You know what I mean? That's what a soldier does. The next morning, Phil Campion and the rest of his unit climbed into a Chinook helicopter. He was carrying 80 pounds of kit, including his body armour, his M14 assault rifle, and enough ammunition and grenades for hours of fighting. The mission they call Operation Certain Death had begun. I, I don't think there was a, a guy there that didn't leave a message, didn't leave a letter with one of his best mates to, to give to his his loved ones should something happen. Do you know what I mean? There's some scenarios you can get yourself into where you feel happier than others, put it that way. And this one was like, whoa, what are you going to do that? <laughs> you know what I mean? So the very essence of the regiment, who dares wins, this was going to be a who dares win. You know your job inside out by then, so you know what your mate's going to be doing, you know where he's going when he gets off the chopper, you know what you're going to do if he doesn't manage to go that way. So you, you, you're fairly much, the plan's in your face now, you, you, it's stored up here, you know, you're just, you're just waiting for that ramp to come down now and you're off. Lord Guthrie was the head of the British Army at the time. On operations you get psyched up, um, there's no question about that. 
um, and uh, everybody wants it, as, and you get a sort of working together uh, cooperation, which is quite difficult to explain because it's extraordinarily dangerous what you're doing. But, um, you know, well-trained soldiers get on and do it. September 10th, 2000, 0600 hours. As the helicopters closed in on the rebel base, the SAS fighters sat in silence. Sergeant Major gave a speech, you know what I mean? He read everybody up for it, do you know what I mean? Not, they, they were up for it anyway, but he, he just gave sort of like a real, a real warry speech, do you know what I mean? I'm not going to go through the contents of it now, but he's really, he really got people going, do you know what I mean? And the first sort of like, as the choppers were taking off and we went up into the holding pattern, everyone's like, yeah, come on, let's go. And then towards the, you know, the loadie gives you the, the two minute warning and then you get the sort of like 30 second warning. And that's when really the whole chopper just, and it stops and you, you become completely focused in. You know, nobody's yelling, nobody's screaming, everyone's just right, ready to get out there and do what he's doing. You know what I mean? And that's, that's, I think we had some, we had someone, a para on our chopper who was, who was sat at the back and I think they were like, Jesus, look at this lot. <laughs> I mean, it was, you know, if you'd, have, if you'd have been a fly on the wall watching it, I think, you know, you'd have been fairly, fairly impressed with it. Do you know what I mean? Because, you know, for a motley bunch of Brits, who did some serious things that morning. Major Marshall awoke to a rumbling sound in the distance. He looked out and noticed that the camp was quiet and deserted. The West Side boys were still asleep or hung over, having enjoyed vast amounts of alcohol the night before, a generous gift from the British negotiators. So the rebels had been partying all night long on this truckload of free booze provided by the British, believing that they had succeeded in every single thing they'd ever dreamed of in terms of taking these, these British soldiers hostage. The engine sounds were getting louder. Marshall woke up his regiment. The rescue team had come for them. The four-man observation team were in contact with the pilots and telling them, you can come in, you can come in, there's no one moving, there's no one moving, it's light enough to see, it's light enough to see. And so the airborne assault force flew up to the rebel base using the Rockle Creek, the river upon which the rebel base was situated, to hide their progress as they came in. So the helicopters were invisible to the naked eye, but far more importantly, you couldn't hear them because the jungle to either side of the river masked the approach of the assault. Suddenly, Marshall heard the slam of a door. A rebel fighter ran out of his hut, looking confused and aggravated. He started to shout and fire his rifle in the air. The village quickly began to stir. The fighters looked shocked and frenzied, but they began efficiently forming into packs and getting into defensive positions. One of the rebels, who appeared to be in command, started shouting from across the camp and pointing at the hut. He then grabbed a gun and ran towards the hostage's hut. Marshall ordered his regiment to begin barricading the doors and windows with anything they had at their disposal. With the helicopters still several minutes away, every second counted. Then came the sound of keys in the lock. Marshall frantically began pushing back at the door as the guard tried to force it open. Then, two gunshots. Silence. Marshall peered through the open door to see the rebel guard lying on the floor in a pool of blood. After a week of lying motionless on the jungle floor, the four-man observation team had charged into action. All right, I want to take a second and tell you about this week's sponsor, Hims. It's a new wellness brand for men. Now, I know we can all agree that the key to success is preparedness and a willingness to act. I know you know what I'm talking about. Hair loss. Listen, the fact is, by the time you can see your hair thinning, it's already getting too late. You and I both know that it's way easier to keep the hair that you have than to replace what's lost. So take a second, maybe do a little inventory and look what's going on up there. What's it going to be like in a year? Two years? Listen, don't worry, because Hims is the one-stop shop for hair loss, skin care, and sexual wellness for men. Hims connects you with real doctors and medical grade solutions that are scientifically proven to treat hair loss. This isn't like a snake oil salesperson. You just go to forhims.com, answer a few questions, and boom, it shows up at your door. Here's the best part. Listeners to Covert get a trial month of Hims for just five bucks while supplies last. Check the website for full details. This would cost hundreds if you went to the doctor or a pharmacy. 
Seriously, all you got to do is go to 4 slash OPS. That's F-O-R-H-I-M-S dot com slash OPS. Got it? 4 com slash OPS. Go get them. As far as the hostages are concerned, they don't know what's going on. They've heard gunfire, they've heard helicopters around the village, but they don't know this is, this is a British assault force coming to rescue them. And so when... The British force, the SAS force, goes in to try to secure the room in which the hostages are held. He needs to let the hostages know who he is and that he's a friendly. And so he runs up to the hostage house. They fight their way in there. They get to the door where the hostages are held and they scream out, British soldiers, British soldiers, let us in. And so the hostages know it's the friendly force coming to rescue them that they've been dreaming of happening for, for some time. Black Zorro served nearly two years with the West Side Boys and remembers the day of the rescue operation well. His voice has been translated and spoken by an actor. I was looking around. I heard a strange sound. I turned to see a huge helicopter coming in and men begin to drop down from ropes onto the ground. By now, the helicopter was overhead, making a huge wind. The village was swarming with rebel fighters, spraying the SAS positions with AK-47 fire. In battle, you don't check to see who you've killed. When I fire my weapon, there will be many victims. I don't know who is dead or alive. All I know is when I pull the trigger, the bullets will be flying around the jungle, and no one will be left in front of me. Feet away from the hostage hut, SAS fighters began fast roping out of the helicopters onto the designated landing zone. The site was chosen because it looked flat and treeless in satellite imagery. And it was for good reason. Damien Lewis. So, Chirk comes in, hovers over this flat area of ground. First guy jumps out, first para jumps out with his weapons and his bergen on his back. And lo and behold, he lands up to his neck in a swamp. That initially caused some problems for the operation because men were, were literally uh, uh, sinking into the, uh, into the ground. There's nothing worse than if a plan does go wrong and you, you just are left high and dry. As hundreds of rebel fighters streamed out of their homes, the SAS fighters scrambled to stay afloat in quicksand. They were sitting ducks. The meticulously detailed plan had now gone out the window, and the commanders needed to develop a new strategy on the spot. They huddled together and started to improvise new battle plans. The problem was, the SAS commanders were now all in the same place, making them an easy target. Very quickly, things go really quite badly wrong. The command elements are gathered in an area where they're, where they're basically coordinating the assault and the rebels, they've got their anti-aircraft weapons going, they're trying to shoot down the British helicopter gunships and at the same time they've got a mortar going and a mortar round goes up and comes down and lands in the tree under which the command element of the parachute regiment guys is situated. It explodes in the tree so it's like an airburst and very very quickly you've got the whole command element of that parachute regiment force injured and taken out and needing evacuating. You know, it just, it went off fairly close to me. I got a little bit in my arm. I think a friend of mine was hit, he went down. I felt, I felt sort of like a, a sharp on my arm, but I didn't really, didn't really pay much attention to it. In fact, I remember squeezing off a couple of rounds just to check my finger was still working when, it, when, it, when my arm went, because I thought, fuck, it's my right arm. The only member of the eight-man command unit who escaped serious injury was a young officer, Captain Danny Matthews. He now found himself directing a major battle for the first time. Quickly regrouping his troops, he ordered them to eliminate the greatest source of danger, the mortar launcher. Meanwhile, the rebels descended on the SAS positions from all directions. Phil Campion. When I left the chopper, we took fire from a direction that we hadn't planned to take fire from. We all end up stacked up in a completely different way, facing a completely different part of the village than we were going to because we took so much fire from behind. They were outnumbered five to one. Their command force had been rendered incapacitated, and many of the soldiers were still stuck wading through the quicksand. For the remaining SAS fighters, their years of intensive training kicked into autopilot. They surged through the base, plucking off rebels one by one. 
Rather than take cover behind the wooden huts, SAS fighters shot directly through the walls to the rebels taking cover on the other side. During those very initial moments of the assault, the British force was extremely effective in driving out the rebels. The rebels were, they'd just woken up. Many of them were in their underpants. They were hung over, they were in disarray, and most of them were either killed or they ran for the jungle. But very quickly, the situation changed. Very quickly, the rebels regrouped under their commanders. They decided that battle was to be had with the British force. Outnumbered and with no adequate cover, the SAS couldn't afford to stay in one place. They kept shifting into new positions, moving in tightly arranged formations, with one fighter taking full responsibility for one field of view. But then, an SAS fighter was hit, Damien Lewis. And during that moment, several British soldiers were injured, several of the assault force were injured, and one of them, a soldier called Brad Tinian, who was a, himself a legend within the SAS, was hit and seriously wounded. And at that stage, all the mission objectives start to change. At that stage, you've got a man down, a man down in the assault force. And the commanders know they have to get in not only a helicopter to extract the hostages, who by now are being brought out of the hostage house and rushed up to the, to the football field, in fact, which they're going to use as a makeshift landing zone. But at the same time, you've now got a British soldier, one of the assault force, one of the SAS guys, who's seriously wounded, and you've got to get him out there as well. British Defence Secretary Jeff Hoon. We knew from intelligence how heavily armed the West Side boys were. Clearly they, they, they lacked the discipline, the organisation, the training available to Britain's armed forces. But there was no doubt that they were dangerous, and indeed they were dangerous because they were unpredictable. Okay, so I need to tell you about a new podcast that I think you guys are going to love. PD Stories. PD, as in police department. The stuff these special ops guys do is only the tip of the iceberg. PD Stories goes to the front lines of fighting bad guys every day. It's with Tom Morris Jr. from America's Most Wanted and A&E's Live PD. In each episode, he interviews different cops from all over the country, officers from Vegas, New York, bomb and canine squads, undercover narcotics, gang units, you name it. You hear all sorts of crazy, funny, haunting tales from the streets. And you learn things, too. Like the first episode, it spotlights Sean Sticks Larkin from the Tulsa, Oklahoma gang unit. He explains how and why gangs migrated to Tulsa. Tulsa, Oklahoma. America's heartland. Who knew? You can find PD Stories right now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And be sure to subscribe. I'm going to head over right now and subscribe myself. Again, that's PD Stories. As the call goes out on the radios, bear in mind each of the assault force has his own PRM, personal role radio, which allows all of them to communicate with each, with each other. The call goes out, man down, man down, man down. Very quickly, everyone realises it's Brad Tinian, this guy who's extremely popular in the squadron. And, and you can imagine the feeling of the guys. They now really want to take the battle to the rebels because one of their own has been hurt. The rebel fighters who escaped the village base were now beginning to regroup and return to the firefight. The SAS found themselves having to defend the village from waves of rebels coming in packs from the jungle. But as the firefight raged on, Brad Tinian's condition only became worse. No one thinks it's serious. No one believes Brad himself. No one believes this guy's been seriously injured. But very quickly, it becomes clear this is a serious injury. They have to get him out of there on a chinook and to a hospital where he can get some serious medical care. And so Brad's picked up, he's rushed through the village under fire, he's taken to the football field, the one area in the village which they have already pre-identified as the landing zone into which they'll call the Chinooks to lift out the hostages and now, of course, to take out their wounded. In the hostage hut, two SAS fighters got into defensive positions to protect Marshall and his men. To secure the hostages, they would have to run 100 feet through an open firefight to the location of the first Chinook. The objective of the mission is a hostage rescue mission. So the key thing is to get the hostages out of there. That's the key objective to be achieved by the squadron. The secondary objective is to hold the village, to hold the rebel base, and to make it secure enough to be able to safely extract the assault force. And it's in a matter of minutes that the hostages are got out of the hostage house, they're taken to the landing zone, they're loaded aboard the Chinook, 
and the Chinook flies over there with the seven British hostages and Brad Tinian. Brad and the hostages made it safely aboard the Chinook and took off to a waiting ship to get medical attention. As soon as the hostages are lifted out of the village, you can imagine the word goes around on the radios, hostages secure, hostages secure. At that moment, the whole objective of the mission changes. It then becomes a mission to basically hold the rebel base, make it secure, and let's be frank about it, wipe out the West Side boys and extract the British assault force. Those become the priorities. You've also had an assault going in across the river on the southern side of the river because the secondary rebel base has some long-range firepower that needs to be suppressed because it can shoot down the Chinooks or it can put down fire onto Gberi Banner where the hostages are being rescued. That assault's been carried out by the parachute regiment, the men of the parachute regiment, and some of their men are flown across the river now in Chinooks and landed in Gberi Banner to assist the SAS in basically securing Gberi Banner and winning the firefight. As the firefight raged in Sierra Leone, back in Britain, Defense Secretary Jeff Hoon received bad, bad news from the medical ship. Brad Tinian had passed away. Bombardier Brad Tinian was killed. He was one of the first into the village, uh, an enormously brave man who gave his life in order to rescue his comrades. And uh, uh, tremendous efforts were made, I know, to save his life. Uh, a helicopter pilot uh, picked him up uh, and took him out to a ship uh, that we had stationed uh, off Sierra Leone. Uh, sadly, he had died uh, before uh, further medical uh, attention could be given to him. At the base, the SAS fighters were now more determined than ever to take out the West Side boys, but no one could find the rebel leader, Fode Calais. Amidst heavy fighting, one team began kicking down hut doors, searching for him. The man responsible for the torture and murder of thousands of Sierra Leonean civilians, and now the death of one of their own. They zeroed in on the biggest hut in the village base. They basically kick open the doors and clear each of the rooms. And in one of those rooms, there's a bed, like, you know, a, a wooden bed with a mattress on top of it. And they're about to leave the room because there's no one else in there when someone, some smart guy, thinks to look under the bed. And cowering underneath the bed, not able to move, not able to say a word, is the West Side Boys leader, Fode Calais, the guy who was demanding that he be made the president of Sierra Leone. He's under the bed, hiding and terrified because the British assault force have come in. So they drag him out from under there, and they've got the guy. The guy has caused all this mayhem, all this grief, all this, who's tried to humiliate and drive the British out of Sierra Leone. They've got him, they've got him captive. With their leader, now a prisoner himself, the rest of the West Side boys melted away into the forest. The SAS airlifted many of the injured rebel fighters to get medical treatment. The British were now left standing alone in the infamous rebel base. With the hostages released and the West Side boys gone, the SAS had one more job to do. The soldiers walked to the edge of the village where they found the village cesspit. The iron covering was searing hot from the sweltering African sunlight. As they lifted the metal sheet, they found Lieutenant Musa Bangura. He had been lying in the pit for over 16 days. The SAS fighters jumped down to check Musa's pulse. With his eyes firmly closed, the lieutenant lifted his hand and raised his thumb. Musa was miraculously still alive. The SAS's destruction of the West Side Boys shocked rival rebel armies in Sierra Leone. Other rebel fighters feared that they could be the next target. Thousands began surrendering their weapons in return for amnesty. After over a decade of conflict, the Civil War ended. It sent a message to the rebels which was clear and could not be misinterpreted. If you continue to do what you do, we will come after you and we will hunt you down in your rebel bases, wherever you are, in the jungle, with ultimate force, and your days are numbered. All of the hostages from the Royal Irish Regiment made a full recovery, and many still serve in the British military to this day. Fode Calais was put on trial in the capital city, Freetown, and sentenced to 50 years in prison. The other West Side boys who survived the battle joined a reconciliation process and returned to Sierra Leone. Lieutenant Musa is a major in the Sierra Leonean army. His arms still show the scars from his torture, and his kidneys don't function properly. 
one British soldier was killed in the operation. Another 12 soldiers were injured, one seriously, and there was no shortage of casualties on the other side, as at least 25 young rebel men were killed. But the legacy of the bravery of the SAS has proved the lengths they would go to take care of their men. On the next episode of Covert, we learn the untold story of how one of the most legendary fighting forces in history, the Kidon, Israel's assassination specialists, foiled Syria's secret plan to develop a nuclear bomb. Well, the day that General Dagan came in with all of this material, we didn't know anything. Um, we had zero information um, about a Syrian nuclear reactor. So what we could see was that this was a fairly advanced uh, construction of a nuclear reactor. The first thing we could see was that it was two-thirds finished. I mean, the whole superstructure was there. The second thing we could see was that if you, if you compared it to the Yangbyon North Korean nuclear reactor, it was exactly the same reactor. That's next time on Covert. Mafia is coming back for its second season on Wednesday, June 20th, with gripping stories about the most infamous mobsters the world has ever seen. Want to learn more? Keep an eye on the Covert feed, as we'll have a very special preview in the next few days. Covert is an audio boom and World Media Rights co-production, hosted by me, Jamie Rennell. It is produced by Audio Boom's Ben Hosley and Rachel Jacobs, and by Pascal Hughes for World Media Rights. We had editing help by David Markowitz, with additional production from World Media Rights by Gerald Zabengwa and Damian Thorpe. David McNabb is the series' creative director, and the executive producers for Audio Boom are Brendan Regan and Stuart Last. If you haven't already, don't forget to follow us on Spotify or subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you find your favorite shows. And if you've got some time, give us a review.